Okay, guys, this is the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks for Breakfast Clued, Chapter 28, Part 2. We'll begin on that little small part, you know. Page 225. Okay, here, let us begin. Sir Lorikin and Castor Cofield was a cousin of Deborah's husband, former stepdaughter, or something like that. No one in the family remembers for sure. They also don't know how or when he heard about Henrietta's cells. What they do remember is that one day, Cofield called Deborah, saying that he was a lawyer and that she needed to protect herself and her mother by copywriting the name Henrietta Lacks. He also said he believed Hopkins was guilty of medical malpractice and that it was time to sue for the family's cut of all the money Henrietta Sells had earned since the 50s, a percentage of which he would take as his fee. He would charge nothing up front, and the Lacoses wouldn't have to pay if he didn't win. Deborah had never heard about needing to copyright anything, but the family had always thought they should talk to a lawyer about the cells, and Cofield sounded like one they could afford. Deborah's brothers were thrilled, and soon introduced Cofield to Speed and Wykey as the family's lawyer. Cofield began spending his day at Hopkins, digging through the medical school archives, taking notes. Of other people who had come to the Lacoses over the years talking about the cells, he was the first to tell the family anything specific about what happened to Henrietta at Hopkins. The way the Lacoses remember it, his findings confirmed their worst fears. He told them that one of the doctors who treated Henrietta didn't have a medical license and that another had been expelled from the American Medical Association. On top of that, Cofield said, Henrietta's doctors had misdiagnosed her cancer and might have killed her with an overdose of radiation. He told Deborah he needed to read her mother's medical records to investigate how the doctors had treated her and to document any possible malpractice. Since only Henrietta's family members were authorized to request her records, Deborah agreed to go with him to Hopkins, where she filed out a request form. But the photocopy machine was broken, so the woman behind the desk told Deborah and Cofield they had better come back later, once the machine was fixed. When Cofield returned alone, the staff refused to give him the records because he wasn't a doctor or a relative of the patient. When Cofield said he was Dr. Sir Lord Cannon Kester Cofield, the Hopkins medical records staff contacted Richard Kidwell, one of Hopkins' attorneys. Kidwell got suspicious the moment he heard that someone was poking around Hopkins using the title Dr. Sir Lord, so he did some quick background research. Cannon Kester Cofield wasn't a doctor or lawyer at all. In fact, Cofield had served years in various prisons for fraud, much of it involving bad checks, and he had spent his jail time taking law courses and launching what one judge called frivolous lawsuits. Cofield sued guards and state officials connected to the prisons he had been in, and was accused of calling the governor of Alabama from jail and threatening to murder him. Cofield sued McDonald's and Burger King for contaminating his body by cooking fries and pork fat, and he threatened to sue several restaurants for food poisoning, including the Four Seasons in New York City, all while he was incarcerated and unable to eat at any restaurants. He sued the Coca-Cola company, claiming a bottle of soda he bought was filled with ground glass, though he was in prison that only offered Pepsi products and aluminum cans. He had also been convicted of fraud for a scam in which he got an obituary of himself published, then sued the newspaper for libel and damages up to a hundred million dollars. He told the FBI that he had filed at least 150 similar lawsuits. In various court documents, judges described Cofield as a con artist no more than a gadfly and an exploiter of the court system, and the most litigious inmate in the system. By the time C 
Cofield contact Laxis about suing Hopkins, he had been banned from filing lawsuits in at least two counties. But Deborah knew none of this. Cofield called himself doctor and lawyer and seemed capable of getting and understanding more information from Hopkins than the family ever could. And his demeanor didn't hurt. When Courtney Speed described him to me a few years later, she said, Charisma! Woo! I mean, cream of the smooth! Very well versed and knew something about everything! When Kidwell learned the truth about Cofield, the first thing he did was protect Deborah, something the Lax family never would have expected from someone at Hopkins. He told her that Cofield was a con artist and had her sign a document forbidding Cofield access to her family records. The way everyone I talked to at Hopkins remembers it, when Cofield came back and learned that the family had denied him access, he yelled and demanded copies of the records until a security guard threatened to physically remove him and call the police. Cofield then filed a lawsuit against Deborah Lawrence Courtney Speed, Henrietta Lacks Health History Museum Foundation, and a long list of Hopkins officials. The president, the medical records administrator, and an archivist, Richard Kidwell, and Grover Hutchins, the director of autopsy services. He sued ten defendants in all, and several of the Hopkins employees involved had never heard of Cofield or Henrietta Lacks before their subpoenas arrived. Cofield accused Deborah of speed in the Museum Foundation of breach, of breach of contract for entering an agreement that required him to have access to Henrietta's medical records, then deny him him access. He claimed that Deborah could not legally prohibit him from doing research from for the Henrietta Lacks Health History Film Museum Foundation because she was not a member of its board of directors or officially involved with the foundation in any way. He also claimed racial discrimination, saying he was harassed by Negro security of Joan Hopkins and staff at the South Archives, and that the defendants and employees' actions were all racially motivated and very anti-black. He demanded access to the medical records and the autopsy reports of Henrietta and Deborah's sister, Elsie, as well as damages of $15,000 per defendant plus interest. The most astonishing detail of Cofield's suit was his claim that the Lax family had no right to any information about Henrietta Lax because she had been born Loretta Pleasant. Since there was no official record of a name change, Cofield argued, Henrietta Pleasant had never actually existed, and therefore neither had Henrietta Lax. Whoever she was, he said, the family wasn't legally related to her. In a statement so filed with grammatical, so filled with grammatical errors, it's difficult to understand. He called, Cofield called this an obvious fraud and conspiracy, and claimed that his lawsuit would ultimately lead to the ends of justice for only Mrs. Henry Etalax, and now the plaintiff, who was become the victim of a small but big time. Files of legal documents began arriving almost daily at Deborah's door. Summonses and petitions and updates and motions. She panicked. She went to Turner Station and burst into Speed's grocery store, screaming, demanding that Speed her over anything she gathered related to Henrietta. The documents Speed kept in a superhero pillowcase. The Henrietta slacks t-shirts and pants the video of why he interviewed Day in Speed's beauty parlor. Deborah yelled at Speed, accused her of conspiring with Cofield, and said she was going to hire O.G. Simpson's lawyers, Johnny Cotran, and sue Speed for everything she had if she didn't shut down the foundation and stop all Henrietta-related activities. But Speed had nothing and was just as scared as Deborah. She was a single mother with six sons, 
She planned to put all of them through college using money she made cutting hair and selling chips, candies and cigarettes. Her store was being robbed regularly and she was getting and she was getting just as many court mailings from Caulfield as Deborah was. Soon, Speed stopped opening the letters and let them pile up in the back room of her store until they stacked thirty envelopes high. Then she started a new pile. She prayed to God for the letters to stop and wished her husband was still alive to deal with Cofield. By this time, the BBC documentary had aired, and the reporters were calling Deborah, requesting photos of Henriette and the family, and asking questions about her mother and how she died. But Deborah still didn't know anything beyond what she had re- she had read in Gold's book. It was time, she decided, to find out what her mother's medical records said. So, she requested a copy from Hopkins, along with a copy of her sister's records. She also met with Kitwell, who told her not to worry and promised that Hopkins would fight Cofield. And it did. The case was eventually dismissed, but everyone involved was spooked. When the group of Hopkins that had been working on a plan to honor Henrietta heard about Cofield's lawsuit, they quietly dropped the idea, never telling the Laxes they'd ever even considered it. Years later, when I talked to Grover Hodgkins, the pathologist listed in Cofield's lawsuit, he shook his head and said, The whole thing was very sad. They wanted to have some kind of recognition for Henrietta, but then things got so hairy with Cofield and the crazy things he was saying, the family thought about Hopkins. They decided it was best to let sleeping dogs lie and not get involved with anything having to do with the laxes. When I talked about John, with John Hopkins' spokesperson, Joanna Rogers, she said there had never been an official effort by Hopkins to honor Henrietta. It was an individual effort, maybe one or two people, and where they went away, it went away. It was never an institutional initiative. Though the subpoenas had finally stopped coming, Deborah didn't believe the lawsuit was truly over. She couldn't shake the idea that Cofield might send people to her house to steal her mother's Bible or the lock of her hair she kept tucked inside it. Or maybe she he tried to steal her cells, thinking they might be valuable like her mother's. She stopped checking her mail and rarely left the house except to work her shifts driving a school bus for disabled children. Then she was in a freak accident teenager on the bus attacked her, throwing himself on top of her, biting and scratching until two men ran onto the bus and pulled him off. A few days later, the same boy attacked her again, this time permanently damaging several discs and her spine. Deborah had her husband hang dark curtains on their windows and stopped answering the phone. Then, sitting in her dark living room, a year and a half after Cofield's lawsuit ended, she finally began reading and rereading the full details of her mother's death in her medical records. And for the first time, she learned that her sister had com- been committed to a mental institution called Crownsville. She began worrying that something bad had happened to her sister in that hospital. (gasps) Maybe she was used in some kind of research, like her mother, she thought. Deborah called Crownsville for a copy of Elsie's records, but an administrator said most of Crownsville documents from from before 1955, the year Elsie died, had been destroyed. Deborah immediately suspected that Crownsville was hiding information about her sister, just as she still believed Hopkins was hiding information about Henrietta. Within hours of her call to Crownsville, Deborah became disoriented and had trouble breathing. Then she broke out in hives, red welts covering her face, neck, and body, and even the soles of her feet. When she checked herself into a hospital saying, 
everything going on with my mother and sisters making my nerves break down. The doctor said her blood pressure was so high she had nearly had a stroke. A few weeks after Deborah came home from the hospital, Roland Patillo left a message on her answering machine saying he had been talking to a reporter who wanted to write about a book about Henrietta and herself. And he thought Deborah should talk to her. That reporter was me. This is the end of chapter 28.